Now we have it. Yeah, got it. Shall we? Ah, yes. Uh, let's wait a couple of minutes or uh, well, um, a few seconds, and then we'll do the introductions. Okay, it's four o'clock. Um, so welcome everyone to the sessions of the Virtual Seminars in Economic Theory. Um, today we have Ernesto Rivera Mora from Steel, Arizona. Um, presenting uh, neutral mechanisms on the feasibility of information sharing. We also have uh, our guest panelists today, Jacopo Pairago and Jan Boll. Uh, in terms of the format, the usual, it's a usual format. So one hour talk followed by the Q&A session uh, of 15 minutes. Um, after the Q&A sessions, please stay a couple of more minutes. We, we, we are going to talk informally. The talk is recorded for an hour and, and 15 minutes. Um, we don't have any co-authors today, so uh, we wouldn't, Ernesto is not going to monitor the chat. So if you are there are any clarifying questions, please feel free to, to in, uh, interrupt and ask them live. If you have more general comments, you can leave them in the chat and we'll share it with, uh, with Ernesto afterwards. And next week, as a reminder, we have our last sessions of this academic year, Ravi Yagadisan, from Stanford uh, presenting auctions with withdrawal rights. All right, Ernesto, um, the monitor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the organizers of the seminar and in particular to Max. Uh, and thank you also to Ian and, and Jacopo for jo joining us today. So today I'm going to be talking about my job market paper called Neutral Mechanisms on the Feasibility of Information Sharing. So this is, this paper is about the design of institutions or mechanisms for information sharing, for the sake of information sharing. And there are many reasons why we may care about information sharing. For instance, firms are known to conceal harmful information about their products. We have the example of the tobacco industry, which concealed the dangers of smoking. We have the example of Purdue Pharma, which concealed the the harmful uh, addictive properties of opioid-based painkillers. And more recently, uh, we have the example of uh, uh, social media companies that have been concealed or uh, the negative outcomes that they induce in young users. As a consequence, well, regulators would like to design institutions that incentivize firms to reveal their private information about the products they, they produce. And, okay, it's not working. My, okay, and in particular, they would like to know if there are institutions that can achieve uh, information sharing or if it is impossible to find such institutions. So to tackle this type of questions, I'm going to analyze a general framework uh, that I'm going to analyze not only the context of uh, firms with danger, pro dangerous products, but any, any other context where there are going to be two agents, one expert and one layman, where the expert is going to observe a payoff relevant state of the world that is chosen by nature, while the layman will not. And absent of any information sharing, they are going to be playing a game of incomplete information. For instance, the expert and the layman may be two firms competing either in prices and, or in quantities where the state of the world is maybe the, the, a demand shock, right? A shock to the demand uh, to, to both firms. So, Normally, uh, there are many papers that study this type of situations, and they usually have the following structure. Where first the expert learns the state, then they play a mechanism where they can potentially share information, and then they, get, they play the game of incomplete information. Examples include, um, sorry, the examples include, include cheap talk, money boarding, mediation, noisy communication, delegation, arbitration, hard evidence, or Blackwell experiments. And papers typically analyze one type of mechanism or try to compare different types of mechanisms, see uh, what difference they have. Now, by contrast, I'm going to be analyzing a broad class of mechanisms that I call neutral, neutral mechanisms. And the goal will be to understand when this class of mechanisms can achieve full revelation of the state of the world or when this class is completely futile for any information sharing. 
Uh, examples of neutral mechanisms are cheap talk, money burning, mediation, noisy communication, but delegation, arbitration, hiring, and experiments are not examples of neutral mechanisms. So to understand why, let me, um, let me describe what is a neutral mechanism. So neutral mechanisms are going to be extensive forms that satisfy four conditions. The first condition is a structural independence. By this, I mean that the set of actions and information sets in this extensive form has to be completely independent of the state of the world. For instance, cheap talk and money burning are examples of mechanisms that satisfy this requirement because an agent can always say that the state is high or burn money independent of the realization of the state of the world. By contrast, the provision of verifiable evidence as in Milgram or Grossman is not, does not satisfy structural independence. Why? Well, whether an agent can provide evidence or not, well, in general, it's going to depend on the state of the world. The second condition is going to be statistical independence. I'm going to allow in this uh, mechanism to ch for chance moves, uh, but I'm going to require chance moves to be completely independent of the state of the world. So by doing, do by doing this, I am basically um, uh, um, not allowing for Blackwell experiments or any uh, or, or information design in general. So the only way that the layman can learn information about the state of the world is through the experts' actions in the mechanism, not by observing chance moves. Okay. The third condition is going to be outcome independence. So I am going to allow in these mechanisms for transfers as a way to convey information, for instance, through use of money burning. However, I'm not going to allow uh, transfers. So I'm going to require transfers only to depend on the actions taken in the mechanism, but not in the state of the world. For instance, I'm going to be ruling out Spence classical signaling model, where the cost of education depends on the state of the world, right? Depends on the level, uh, ability level of the agents. So I'm not going to allow for this type of uh, mechanisms that have heterogeneous cost in terms of the state of the world. But I'm going to allow for others that like money burning where did not happen. In addition, I'm going to require the mechanisms to satisfy gain independence. And this is basically saying that the outcome of the mechanism cannot change the set of actions nor the payoffs of the agents in the game of incomplete information. So for instance, I'm going to be ruling out delegation and arbitration models where we are basically changing who is going to be taking the actions or action contingent transfers, which are basically changing what are going to be the payoffs of the game of incomplete information. Now, uh, there are many examples in the literature that, uh, of neutral mechanisms, for instance, cheap talk, cheap talk in many stages, uh, that is called long cheap talk, noisy communication channels, mediation mechanisms, money burning, and even message contingent transfers. Notice that in all of these mechanisms, the set of actions in the mechanisms doesn't depend on the state of the world. Chance moves do not uh, depend directly on the state of the world. And also that the only way that these mechanisms can influence the outcome of the game of incomplete information is through changes in information only, not by changing the fundamental parts of the game of incomplete information. Okay. Now, given that this Plus, broad class of mechanisms is extensively uh, studied in the literature. And in some sense, it's, it's a class of mechanisms that are easy to implement in the sense that I can take any of these mechanisms from one context and take it to another context and still could potentially work. I, I would like to understand when, uh, when do neutral mechanisms allow for information change? And in particular, I would like to understand when they can fully reveal the state of the world or when this class of mechanisms are completely futile for any information share. Okay, so that's going to be the research question. And to do so, I'm going to use a new approach that I call the reduced form approach. Okay, what do I mean by this approach? So this is the setting that we are analyzing. It has three stages. First, the, lay, the expert learns the state of the world, then they play the, the mechanism, and then they play the game of incomplete information. Now, um, as I said before, I'm not going to be only analyzing one single type of neutral mechanisms. I would like to, to analyze the entire infinite class of neutral mechanisms. And this is going to be challenging because in each of these neutral mechanisms, the agents are going to be learning different things. 
right? And in each of these neutral mechanisms, basically, are going to define or induce a Bayesian gain that depends on the things that uh, the agents learn. And moreover, some of these Bayesian gains that the mechanisms are inducing are not going to be trivial to analyze because the beliefs of the agents may not be common knowledge, right? The expert may not know, for instance, with mediation, we do not know what the mediator told to the layman, right? So there may not be common belief of what the agent's beliefs are, uh, common knowledge of what the agent's beliefs are. So what I'm going to be, is, uh, how, how I'm going to be using this reduced approach is by uh, noting the following key observation. That is that for the sake of analyzing if information sharing is possible or not, it's not going to be necessary to analyze behavior on each of these Bayesian games that can be induced. Uh, what is required is only to analyze what's the agent's value of information across all these Bayesian games. The agent's value of information is basically described by, by the preferences about beliefs and hierarchies of beliefs that are induced by, by these neutral mechanisms. Those beliefs and hierarchies of beliefs are going to basically influence how the agents behave in the Bayesian games and, they, and ultimately are going to influence what are going to be the equilibrium payoffs in these Bayesian games. So what I'm going to be doing uh, for the reduced form approach is to capture the agent's preferences for information by using reduced form belief-based utility functions. Utility functions that uh, depend on the beliefs of the agents. Okay, so I'm going to substitute the Bayesian games and instead of they playing a, this Bayesian game, they ultimately receive the payoffs associated with these belief-based utility functions that depend on the information that the agents got in the, in the mechanism. For the expert, it's going to depend on the information he got. In particular, it's going to depend on the state of the world and his hierarchies of beliefs that describe his beliefs about the layman's beliefs. And for the layman, well, it's going to depend on the information he has he doesn't observe the, the state, so that's why it doesn't depend on the state, but has higher piece of belief that basically describe their beliefs about the state of the world and the hierarchies uh, of beliefs of the other age. Okay? So Vesto, can I ask a clarifying we, question? Yeah, sure. Uh, sorry, about the Bayesian game in the red, in the red rectangle. Yeah. The, yeah. the the game is between only two players, so the the sender and receiver. Or do you imagine that there is multiple receivers playing in that Bayesian no, game later? I am I am focusing in the entire paper only two agents: one that gotcha. has initially the information, and the other one that doesn't. Gotcha. Thank you. But but, but they, sorry, they but yeah. but they can interact exposed in this Bayesian game as a sort of simultaneous move game or whatever. Be yeah, because, I like, a, uh, uh, you know, the the the, the chip, standard chip talk the game is is just an action in the in the rectangle in the right rectangle yeah. of, of the receiver. But here, it, it could also be a game between the two players. Yeah, yeah, I, and it's going to be a one shot set, a uh, one shot game, this version game, right? I am allowing also oh, for sorry. yeah, sure. I'll finish. I I just uh, when you're done, yeah, yeah. The neutral the mechanism itself could be dynamic, right? Like long chip talk, but you know, in the end, those having a dynamic mechanism doesn't have anything. Uh, so Ernesto, how do you deal with equilibrium multiplicity when you're defining these payoff functions in the in the red game? Yeah. If you wait me for three slides, I'm going to tell you how, but sure. basically Sounds I'm good. going to basically have multiple reduced forms. Okay, great, thanks. Right, I'm going to have a set of reduced forms that are going to basically capture all the potential equilibrium that can may arise. Can I, uh, sorry, Ernesto, I, I need a clarification as well, because yeah. um, when you allow, so you're not allowing Bayesian persuasion or, you know, commitment from the sender, but uh, how about a model where the receiver writes a contract for um, the sender? Um, you mentioned transfer at some point, but you said, oh, the transfers cannot depend on the state, but can depend on the messages. So I'm a bit confused yeah. whether that model, I mean, I think Krishna and Morgan have an analysis of that, for example, um, yeah. is, a, is, is, is a neutral mechanism or not. I, I guess I could figure it out, but it's easier to yeah, ask. Yeah, so Krishna, Krishna and Morgan like uh, saying like, you know, I'm going to pay you this amount of money if I tell you that the state is high and this amount of money that the state is low. You know, it's basically just a transfer from one agent to the other. Uh, I am allowing for that. What I'm not allowing is to call to 
to restrict the actions that the agents take uh, or the transfers in terms of the actions that the agents are going to take in the in the game, right? That's that delivers a little bit of more commitment power in some sense. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So what? But what I'm doing this here by by substituting the occupation game by these utility form utility functions is that basically I'm transforming the game into a psychological game, a game that depends where the utility depends on the beliefs of the agents. And uh, what I'm going to show here is that by analyzing these utility functions, we are going to provide new insights about when and how information sharing is possible or when it's, uh, it's not possible using this class of mechanism. That's kind of like the goal of the paper, which are basically going to be captured by my main theorem. My main theorem is going to have two parts. It's going to be a, have a complete revelation result and an impossibility result. The complete revelation result is going to state that uh, well, everything is going to depend on the expert's religious form, the utility function of the expert. And if this belief-based utility function satisfies a, a supermodularity condition between the beliefs and the state that I'm going to later define, then complete information sharing will be possible. And by contrast, the impossibility result is going to state the opposite. It's going to state that if the expert reduces form satisfy some notion that I will later define of some modularity between the beliefs and the state, then no relevant information sharing, not even partial is possible. So basically the agents are going to interact in this game of incomplete information as if they didn't interact in any mechanism at all. Okay. Now I'm going to later define these notions, but I would like to give you the intuition of what they capture. And when we are talking about the state of the world that is a real number, Basically, supermodularity is going to capture the idea that a high state expert has a stronger incentives to be perceived as having observed a high state of the world. Okay. By contrast, submodularity is going to capture the opposite. It's going to capture the idea that a high state expert is going to have a strong incentives, a stronger incentives to be perceived as observed a lower state of the world. So basically, what we are saying here is that the game of incomplete information is inducing the expert to strongly try to deceive the, the, the layman, and therefore there will be no, 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 no not even partial information sharing in this, uh, in this mechanism. If we would like to achieve some information sharing, we will need to, to go beyond this class of mechanisms, maybe using evidence-based model or maybe information design, et cetera. Okay, so let me go quickly to the literature. Uh, you know, my paper is going to relate it to all the literature about information sharing. Some of them are going to be using neutral mechanisms. Some of them are not going to be using neutral mechanism. And in particular, my paper is going to be related. The part, the positive, the complete revelation result is going to be related to some papers that show a complete revelation result for for a very particular game of incomplete information. Okay. I'm going to try, my, my result is going to be general for, for general uh, games. And in particular, I don't know if there are out there in the literature uh, such a strong negative results as I am providing here in this paper. And of course, because I am transforming the, the game into a psychological game, my paper is going to be related to the letter of psychological games. And in particular, it's going to be related to a particular a small set of literature that uses the belief utility functions, belief dependent utility functions as a way to summarize outcomes of future interactions, as in as done in Morris, Otavien and Sorensen, and, and Dorsak. Okay. So let me give you uh, a roadmap of what is the, the rest of the talk. Uh, I'm Ernesto, to give you can, I, very, can yeah? I jump in? Sure. I think I think it would be useful to uh, to spend one minute uh, explaining uh, why you think that the restriction to neutral mechanism is uh, has applied uh, interest as in a designer regulator could uh, for example introduce penalties for uh, lying which of course could re realize on the exposed you mentioned uh, um, Purdue Pharma for example right so in a sense um, restricting attention uh, restricting attention to neutral mechanism seems to be a substantive assumption. Um, so I, will, I wanted to get your opinion on, on why this particular class is of interest. Um, yeah. So, so I am analyzing this class uh, because the minimal requirements in terms of commitment power that we require. It's like a, like a 
natural benchmark that I, I think that we will like, well, if we don't have strong commitment power as the penalties that you were mentioning or evidence-based model, you know, let's look first, understand what can this class can and cannot do and what we understand the environment where, for instance, we cannot achieve information sharing, we understand when we need, for instance, evidence-based models or, or penalties, as you are suggested. So this is kind of like a benchmark that will help us to understand when do we need to not, we don't need to look beyond this class and it's, it's a very easy to achieve information sharing. And when do we need a stronger commitment power or stronger assumptions in the model or in the environment to achieve information sharing? Very good, thank you. Okay, thank so, you. yeah, you're, you're welcome. So let me go now to the example. Uh, it's going to be very simple. We don't need the reduced form approach for this example, but it's going to illustrate the ideas of why, uh, how I am using the tools here. So in this uh, environment, there are going to be two agents, a firm and a regulator. The firm is going to develop a painkiller and there, there are two states, it's either safe or addictive. I'm going to say that safe and addictive are real numbers and um, safe is higher than addictive. This will be relevant later on. And that the probability of the safe state is lower than one half. The regulator doesn't observe this. The firm observes the state of the world, but the regulator does not. And the regulator will be choosing either approve or ban the painkiller. The payoffs are fixed, are common knowledge and are given by the following table. Uh, the regulator is the first entry, the regulator's payoff. And basically he would like to match the state with the right action. Right, approve with safe, ban with addictive, and receive payoff of one, uh, only if it matches uh, the right action with the right state. The firm on the other side, on the other hand, is going to have zero profits if the painkiller is banned. It's going to have a normalized profit of one if he can, uh, if the painkiller is approved and the and it is safe. And if it is addictive, he's going to receive and it's approved, he's going to receive a payoff of A where A can be higher or lower than one. Uh, you know, it could be higher, for instance, if we think that selling an addictive product is going to increase revenue sales, or could be lower than one if we think that there are going to be certain lawsuits or you know, fines regarding of selling a, an addictive product. Okay, so I am allowing for both possibilities. Um, so, uh, so the question will be to understand uh, can neutral mechanisms achieve information sharing this, in this setup? And sorry, yeah. Can neutral mechanisms achieve information sharing in this setup? And the result is going to be depending on the on the value of A. And in particular, if A is lower than one, I'm going to be showing that there is a complete revelation result. And if A is higher than one, we are going to have that not not even partial information sharing is going to be possible if we only focus on this class of neutral mechanisms. Okay, so, um, so yeah, so to show this, I'm going to focus on a very small class of neutral mechanisms that are going to show, you know, why the results are holding. The results also hold for any neutral mechanism that we can think. So this class of neutral mechanisms is basically just costly public messages. There is going to be a set of messages. Uh, the firm is going to choose a message that is going to be commonly observed by both agents, and there is going to be a cost associated with this message. Uh, the regulator is going to have a posterior about the safe state of the world given by P of M that endogenously depend on, on the message M. And they are going to be playing an after, an after game after, after they send the, the message. And here, sorry, my computer is a little bit slow. Yeah, so basically, the, sorry. So basically the reduced form approach is going to try to analyze what are the belief-based utilities of these agents in terms of the state of the world and the posterior P? And with that, I'm going to try to, to say what are going to be the values A that allow or preclude information sharing. So to use the reduced form, we basically need to understand what are going to be the, the agents expected payoffs and the end of the mechanism. And in particular, we will need to understand what are going to be the, sorry, the how the regulator should play and what are the exact incentives of the firm, given how the regulator is going to be playing in this in this in this Bayesian game? So, for this particular example, uh, the regulator is going to have a, the, the reduced form as follows: uh, If he has a, a posterior p of the safe state of the world, 
when choosing, choosing, choosing a proof is going to give him an expected payoff of P, and choosing a band is going to give an expected payoff of one minus P. So he basically just take the maximum of them, and it's going to choose a proof if he has a P higher than one half. So this is the reduced form of the regulator. And um, for the firm, well, it's going to depend on the approval probability of the, of the regulator. The approval probability of the regulator, well, is going to be zero if the posterior is below one half. It's going to be one if the posterior is above, above one half. And it's going to be certain number X because uh, if it is exactly in one half, because the, in that case, the, the regulator will be indifferent between approval or, or ban. And once that we have the approval probability, we can write the reduced form of the expert in the following way, which is which is going to depend on uh, on, on basically the approval probability uh, when the safe is when the state is safe and multiplied by a when the safe, when the state is addictive, right? So in this reduced form approach, basically I'm going to analyze this utility function of the frame to say when and how information sharing is possible or not. Okay, so for the positive result, supermodularity is going to be pinned down by only what happens at, at extreme posterior beliefs. So basically, I'm going to say that U of F, the utility function of the firm, uh, satisfies the supermodularity condition if it satisfies increasing differences in the set of states of the world and the number zero and one, taking into account that the safe state, the blue one, is higher than the red state. Right, so basically, this just this just uh, uh, holds with the standard increasing difference, which is easy to see that will hold if whenever a is lower than one half. Um, basically, I claim that under this uh, supermodularity condition, I can construct a mechanism where where there is full revelation of the state of the world, and in this case, it's a very simple mechanism where there are going to be two states: one that has zero cost, is free, and one that has a cost between a and one. Okay. And I claim that there is going to be a perfect uh, separated equilibrium uh, where the addictive firm is going to be choosing the free message and the safe firm is going to be choosing the costly message. Why? Well, because the safe firm has a benefit of one of inducing such uh, safe beliefs and the cost is lower than one. And the addictive firm has a benefit of A and the cost of, of inducing safe beliefs is uh, higher than A, quickly higher than A. So therefore, this is a separated equilibrium. Now, I claim that this can only be happening when A is weakly lower than one. And uh, to show this, uh, to show the impossibility result, I, not, I need to look to all the beliefs that are going to be in the zero one. I need to, to look what happens in all the set of beliefs in this set. Uh, and to do that, I'm uh, to talk about what submodularity is, I need to provide an order in this particular set of beliefs. And the order, is going to be given basically by the action taken by, by the regulator, by the, by the approval probability of the regulator. So I'm going to say that P is going to high, be higher, weakly higher than P prime, it provides higher approval probability. And now that I have a complete order characterized by behavior in this Bayesian game, I'm going to be able to define what is the notion of submodularity that is going to help me to, to, to derive the negative result, which is basically says that, well, UFA is going to be strictly submodular, if the standard submodularity condition with this particular order uh, is satisfied, right? If higher types have a strong, sorry, if lower types have a strong preferences to be perceived as higher or inducing safer beliefs than, than the higher type, right? If, you, if, the, if the firm has a strong incentives to deceive the regulator. Um, basically, this will happen if, if and only if the, the profits of achieving uh, a safe approval, an approval is going to be higher than one. Okay? I claim that if this is satisfying, then there will be no, no mechanisms that is going to achieve information sharing, not even partial. And why this is the case? Well, this will be followed by two equilibrium properties of this example. One given by submodularity that basically states that if the addictive firm chooses a red message and the safe firm chooses a blue message, it has to be the case that the approval probability of the red message is going to be weakly higher than the other message, right? Because that's how the, 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 the addictive firm has stronger preferences to induce higher probability of, uh, of approval. And on the other hand, the regulator is beginning to be using a best response in this uh, Bayesian game. 
And it has to be the case that approval probability is going to be on average weekly higher after messages sent by the, by the safer. Otherwise, we will not be using a best response. And taking together these two equilibrium properties, we achieve to the conclusion that approval probability is going to be constant in the message, right? The message has basically no impact in the approval probability. So basically, there is no useful, trans, uh, no useful information shared in this, in this setting. The, the agents or the regulator is going to be taking the, the action, uh, the informative action, right? So basically, we have this impossibility result. Uh, which are given summarized by this table. Um, this is easy to extend not only to costly public message, but also general neutral mechanisms, including you know, costly messages with may combined, combined with mediation mechanism, et cetera. Uh, basically, it's just uh, the same argument, just in terms of the expectations um, of what is going to happen. Okay, so-, so uh, that's I, and yeah, one so one second, one second. Um, so I guess I have one question. Um, yeah. The um, so the the positive result here uh, it, it's very clean, right? I, the, the way it's constructed, yeah. uh, the mechanism is very simple, and it involves this uh, sort of mo um, essentially money burning uh, scheme. And I just want wondering how general is this? Um, um, you know, I understand your results will say something like. Uh, there exists one mechanism in which there exists one equilibrium in which there is full revelation, but can you characterize what this mechanism is and is it usually this simple or yeah. does it always involve money burning? Is money burning some, somehow uh, like first order in terms of uh, uh, you know, yeah. coming up with these yeah. mechanisms? It always involves either money burning or transfers, right? Like, you know, the ability of me, you know, money burning is a very inefficient way to achieve this. And um, we can achieve this, for instance, if I am giving money to you, right? And I am click, this is the high state. Here is right. the money that is credibly revealing that I have this state. Uh, and, there, and yeah, the, the construction of this is pretty analogous to this. Just, you know, we can use either money burning or transfer schemes. Gotcha. And in this uh, I had a m m clarification question, can you go back to the yeah. submodularity condition? And this is just like me being very slow, but uh, here I'm, I'm not, because of the, sp the, the, the special structure of the example, um, the, 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 the posterior beliefs uh, uh, that matter are on, it, uh, the only thing I, I need to know is whether the posterior belief is smaller than one half or or above one half, and then of course the result that is that uh, at one half we we're gonna have some troubles, but let's ignore that for now. Um, I was wondering is can can I rewrite this it, for at least for this example? Can I rewrite this definition as using the extremes as you did for supermodularity, or instead I need to go through this? Is or, or instead? Um, I need to actually define submodularity on the whole space of beliefs from zero to one. Great question. So for the for the general result or or even this result, if you want to say that not even partial information can be achieved, you need to look to all beliefs, right? What is happening in all beliefs, not only in the extremes. If you only want to know if full revelation information is feasible or not, you only need to look at the extremes. But if you would like to achieve a strong negative result that says not even partial information that is useful can be achieved, we need to actually look to all the potential intermediates, yeah. right? Um, mm. I see, yeah. I see. That's a great, great question. And it will be in general, right? In general, we will need to look to all the potential hikes of beliefs that can be induced because, you know, we would like to know if partial information is achievable or not. That's uh, that's what I'm going to, how, how do we do it? How do we you know, define the orders? That's what uh, the paper is going to be about. Yeah, so let me give you the model, the general model. In the paper, I go beyond the real numbers. I'm going to assume that we have a finite state space of, of uh, states that are going to be part of the real line. Full support common prior, the expert of the state, the layman will not. We are going to pay a one shot after game where the actions are going to be given by the, by the set AI for each agent and the payoff depend on the set of actions and the state of the world, okay? Uh, basically, this is the input of the problem, and, and we are going to be using 
neutral mechanisms, right? The mechanisms that uh, satisfy these four conditions that I described at the beginning, which basically describe that, well, the mechanism itself does not depend on the state of the world, right? The rules of the mechanism is going to be independent of what the state we are in. And the game G is not going to be dependent on the outcome of the mechanism. And because we have like these two properties, the reduced form is going to be suitable for analyzing these type of questions, right? Uh, what we are going to be doing is to, we are going to be basically concatenating the mechanism and the game and having this timeline where first nature selects the state, the expert learns, then they play the mechanism, then they are going to be playing the, the game of incomplete information, and the payoffs are going to be assumed to be quasi-linear in the payoff from the game and the transfer that we obtain from the mechanism. Okay, and that's an assumption that we need to use uh, for, for using a reduced form approach. Okay, so given that we have like the setup, we are going to focus on solution concept, perfect Bayesian equilibrium. Ernesto, and what going to be, yes. Ernesto, I'm sorry, yes. can, I, can I just try to map this description that you just made to the example yes. that you've given us? So yes, in, sure. uh, in, in, you know, the costs, so, you know, are, these presumably are not part of, of the game G because... Yeah. They they are part of the mechanism, right? Yes. So exactly. so you you just basically the what the mechanism does is generates beliefs, um, and then the game is played with posterior beliefs instead of prior beliefs that you had you had before. Exactly. So in that particular game, the game is is kind of basic. The sender does nothing. The receiver decides to approve or not approve. Is that is that yeah. what we need to think about? Okay. Yeah, so, that's very correct. Okay. Yeah. yeah, no, normally a mechanism generates a game itself. Here you're kind of splitting the two the two notions. The mecha you're kind of doing um, a sort of information design under constraints exercise. Does that does that does that does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So, so the idea is that we would like to see what are the preferences for information. Given that preferences of information as given, we are basically using backward induction and try to see, well, can we achieve information sharing given that we have these preferences for information? That's kind of the, the goal. Here. Okay. okay. And one more question, Esther. Yes. So far you've defined these neutral mechanisms kind of axiomatically saying they satisfy these four properties. Is there any way yes. to give an explicit description? I mean, to me, it sounds like the designer just elicits messages and then sends out messages and sends out transfers. Is that is that a complete characterization of the class of mechanisms satisfying those axioms? Yeah, I'm just, you know, because there are literature on dynamic mechanisms that include, you know, long chip talk. And I just want to be clear that I am also covering those, right? Which from a Myerson perspective, we know that it's like they don't achieve like more than what we can achieve with direct mechanisms. But, uh, you know, I just want to be clear that you know, dynamic mechanisms uh, are also incorporated in that class. I see. So does that mean we, we could, I know this is, it sounds like it's not the approach you're taking, but could we apply the revelation principle and just say the expert reveals their yeah. type to the mechanism, the mechanism makes possibly yeah. stochastic action recommendations to the agents and also tells them their YIs, or I guess they don't even have to tell them the YIs, they just eventually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The YIs. So we can use a, a revelation principle to reduce the set of mechanisms that we can analyze. Still, we're going to have a broad class of mechanisms because, you know, even though they are directed as you know, infinite, and we will I still, I, I would argue that, well, this reduce our form approach, you know, can simplify things. Okay, great, thanks. So, so basically we're transforming, the idea is to, to transform it into a psychological game that is going to have three stages. First, nature selects, then the expert observes, and then they play the mechanism. The agents are going to be, um, uh, learning or updating their hierarchies beliefs, you know, their beliefs and beliefs about their be others' beliefs, and they are going to receive in their belief based utility payoffs plus the transfer they obtain in the mechanism, again, assuming quasi linear. So, this is a psychological game, and we like to now link these two games together the original game with the psychological game. So, to do so, um, we, are, uh, we are going to be still using perfect patient equilibrium and solution concept. So to, so to do so, we are going to construct belief-based utilities as a way to capture the equilibrium payoffs induced, uh, for each induced Bayesian game associated with G. Okay? So to do so, I need to describe what is an induced Bayesian game. It's going to be the game G, you know, the actions and the payoffs, together with a type of structure that describes the agent's beliefs. For a given neutral mechanism N, well, the agent's top structure is going to be given by uh, two things. One is the, the typesets and the reliefs. Uh, the typesets in this 
neutral mechanism is going to be given well for the expert, the state that he observes, and the terminal information of this uh, mechanism. And for the layman, it's going to be given by the terminal information of the mechanism. And agents are going to have beliefs about the types of the directives, right? That are going to be exogenously given in the context of inducing patient gain. Given a type of structure, I can construct what is going to be the hierarchies that are going to be called, you know, given by a mapping that I call DR, DE and DF for, for each of the agents. And that, that depends on the type of each of the agents. So I would like to link the Bayesian induced Bayesian games with uh, this notion that I call the reducer form. So what is a reducer form of G? It's going to be a pair of belief-based utilities such that they capture what are going to be the payoffs associated to each type of the agents, right? Like, you know, when I evaluate at the, at the state and the hierarchy, I actually equal the equilibrium payoff, right? And this is for each inducer patient game that I can uh, uh, construct. For each inducer patient game, and uh, there is always an patient equilibrium such that I am capturing the payoffs of, of such a patient equilibrium. Okay, so given that I have like this notion of reducer form, as uh, I don't remember who, who asked it, uh, there could be multiplicity in the Bayesian games, right? And to deal with this, I need to take not only one reduced form, but maybe multiple reduced forms. You know, I'm going to take a set of reduced forms, and basically I'm going to be saying, well, a set of reduced forms is going to be a reduced form representation of Gs. I am basically capturing all the potential equilibria that may arise in these Bayesian games. And the, the following theorems I'm going to show is that basically we need to analyze this class in this complete class of reduced forms, this set of reduced forms in order to achieve the results that, that it will later be showing. So, so multiplicity of equilibria is not going to be um, a, an issue. Can I, can I ask here, yep. this takes care of the multiplicity of equilibria in, in game G. So, so how to tackle that problem. But in, in, in a communication game, the, the bigger communication game, there could be multiplicity of equilibria and you take care of that because you're just dealing with the feasibility of yeah. a certain outcome and not consider other possible. Yeah, so there will, for instance, all of, there will be all this value in equilibrium if I try to achieve the gain. Yeah. There are multiplicity of equilibrium. The result says that when there are one equilibria that I can pick that where the agents fully reveal the information or when there is no equilibrium at all, that any information sharing will be happening. So Excellent. the two results are taking about the, this set of, uh, of uh, equilibria of the entire game that could be like the psychological or the standard one. So here is kind of like the more the main technical contribution. How do we are going to to define submodularity? Okay, so submodularity basically, well, I have already a, a, an order on the set of states. I need an order on the set of hierarchies of beliefs of the state, right? So I to do that, I'm going to provide a trick which is basically, I'm going to reduce the dimension of this set of hierarchies of beliefs, but in a, in a very particular way, or in different particular, different particular ways. So what I'm going to be using is the notion of an statistic. An statistic is going to be just a mapping from the set of hierarchies of beliefs of both agents to the real numbers. And I'm going to focus on the statistics that are well-behaved in the following sense, in the sense that a high statistic signals that the state is high, okay? What do we mean by this? Well, it comes out that any strategy profile in any mechanism is going to be inducing an ex-ante distribution of states and hierarchies of beliefs. You know, give me any mechanism, any strategy profile, I can, you know, agents of data using base rule, I can tell you what the distribution, the ex-ante distribution of states and hierarchies is going to be. I'm going to call a mapping F acute and statistic acute. If for any strategy profile of each mechanism, two, two conditions are satisfied. First, that the state is positive correlated with, this, this, uh, with the statistic. And second, if for some reason you choose a strategy profile where the state and, and the statistic are non correlated, then it has to be the case that F evaluated the hierarchy equals the prior value, it equals the, the value evaluated the prior hierarchy of beliefs, almost surely. Okay? So these are the conditions that basically provide a meaningful way to provide different orders to the set of hierarchies and beliefs in the sense that high F is going to signal high, high state of the world. And what I'm going to show is that this way of ordering the set of hierarchies of beliefs have important implications for the sake of the results that I'm going to be showing. 
So the idea here is that, well, once that, well, let me give you examples of this first. Uh, one example is the approval probability, you know, given that we have two states of the world that are real numbers and are order in this following sense, the approval probability, which is basically this function, this step function that I described before, is going to satisfy these two conditions. They are always, for any strategy equilibrium, uh, for any strategy profile in any mechanism, always are positive correlated. And if it comes out that they are not, then the approval probability has to be equal to the prior value, which is zero because the prior was lower than one half, okay? There are a lot of other uh, statistics that satisfy this condition. For instance, the hierarchies of expectations of the ages, right? The second order expectation of the expert, right? The, expect, the expert expectation about the layman expectation about the state of the world is going to also satisfy these conditions, okay? There is a, a, a broad class of statistics that satisfy this. That's what I show in the paper, and they are useful to, to get some results in some applications that hopefully I will have time to briefly describe. So the idea here is that, uh, well, how do we define submodularity? Well, this is the idea that we wanted to capture, you know, high state expert, expert has strong incentive to be perceived as having a low state or a low statistic, you know, but basically that's what I'm going to try to describe. Uh, basically, I'm going to say that, well, the function, the utility function of the expert is strictly submodular with respect to a particular statistic if uh, for any two hierarchies of, 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 for any two lotteries of hierarchies of beliefs, uh, the expert, one that provides a higher expectation of the statistic than the other, the expert with the lower statistic, with the, with the lower state, would like to have a stronger incentive to induce the higher, the higher, um, the lottery with the higher expectation of the statistic. Okay, that's basically what the strict sum model light is going to capture. Just in, you know, this is described in terms of math. But if we have like this condition, I'm going to be showing uh, basically the impossibility result, um, which is the follow. Suppose that we have a reduced form representation with multiple reduced forms. And for each one, I can find an acute statistic such that U is a strict submodular, you know, the condition I just defined it. And F is essential for this belief uh, based utility in the sense that. We can only change the payoffs of the agents if we move the statistic in some way, right? If we, uh, you know, if there is variance in this uh, statistic, indexante distribution of the states and, and beliefs. If that's happening for any reduced form of the reduced form representation, then basically there is no mechanism that allows for any information sharing, not even partial. And the intuition is as follows. Basically, some modularity requires that low values of the statistic has to be assigned with high state experts. The fact that F is acute is basically states the opposite, that it has to be the case that high values of the statistic has to be assigned to high value, high state experts. So therefore, because F is acute, there will be no change in F. And because there is uh, uh, F is essential, we're basically saying that, well, we cannot change the payoffs of the agents. The agents are completely indifferent between participating in this mechanism or not participating in the, in the mechanism at all. Okay. So this is kind of like the idea of the, of the impossibility theorem, like basically capturing the idea that we have strong incentives for deception. We cannot achieve any relevant information sharing. Any question? So, Basically, the, the other result, the, you know, the, the full revelation result is going to be the opposite. But as I said, we don't need to look to all the hierarchies of beliefs. We only need to look at the extreme hierarchies of beliefs where there is common belief on certain state of the world. So basically, we don't need to look at all the hierarchies. We only need to look at this particular set of the generate hierarchies of beliefs. Uh, basically, I only need to define what supermodularity means in these particular sets, where the order of the hierarchies are going to be inherited by the state of the world. Um, there is going to be basically a very simple way to define supermodularity, which is as given here, uh, sorry, which is basically give me the positive result that says that if I can find a reduced form that satisfies this weak supermodularity condition, you know, basically high types have a stronger incentives we perceive as high. I can always find transfer schemes that can allow for a separated equilibrium. So that's basically the positive result, the opposite result, right, uh, of, um, of this paper, uh, which is basically this, right? If we satisfy this condition, 
we can satisfy, we can find full revelation of the state of the world. Intuition is that, well, higher types, again, have stronger incentives to be perceived as, as higher types, and this could be achieved with him, by using money born in or certain transfer schemes that allows for, 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 for full revelation of the state. Now, let me go really quick. Ernesto. We have only, yeah, sure. Any question? Yes, um, just a sanity check. Uh, so you're you're using two different defin uh, two different definitions. One for supermodularity, yeah. one for so, so. So just just as a sanity check. Is it true that uh, um, one is stronger than the other in the sense that minus u e if, if minus u e is uh, submodular in the way you define, then it's also going to be uh, weakly super uh, Sorry then UE is going to be weakly supermodular in the way that you just defined here. Yes. As in, did, okay. So, so this is... But not this the other way around, because... No, of course, of course. Yeah. Okay. I guess that yeah. as, an, as another comment here, it's a little bit... It's a little bit hard to understand why this is a reduced form. As in, it doesn't seem simpler then just analyzing the whole spectrum of Bayesian games that can arise uh, um, from a, any, any mechanism. Because here you're defining giving, this function. Maybe giving an example could clarify well, it's not in some instance could be um, easier. Yeah. Let's go for it. Yeah, so let me let me go, let me describe an application which is an oligopoly uh, in a problem. So there are two firms, one uh, one is going to observe the, the demand intercept, right? There are two firms competing in either in prices or in quantities. Their payoffs are going to take a simple quadratic form uh, that basically can capture either price competition or quantity competition. And they have basically linear best responses. Uh, when we have, um, there is going to be a parameter alpha, which is that whenever it's positive, we have a price competition, namely strategic completeness. When we have alpha negative, we have strategic substitutes, namely quantity competition. Now it comes, for instance, for this game, the reduced form is extremely simple. It's going to be given by a statistic that, well, it's not that simple. The statistic itself is going to be an infinite sum of the hierarchies of expectation of the layman. But it comes out that whenever I, I found this statistic, the Bayesian equilibrium that is going to be unique as a, for this particular Bayesian game and the reduced forms are going to be extremely simple and are going to be given by these, uh, by these uh, uh, equations, which are going to be very easy to analyze in terms of super and submodularity, right? For instance, what I'm going to be showing is that well, whether information sharing is possible or not, it's going to completely depend on the parameter alpha. And uh, one can show, for instance, with price on competition, that good news firm is going to have a higher reward of inducing optimistic beliefs. And on the other hand, quantity competition is going to have the opposite, right? A good news firm is going to have a higher reward for inducing pessimistic beliefs about the, the demand. Uh, basically, it's very easy to show that these conditions of super and submodularity are, are satisfied in, in each of these cases, respectively. And therefore, uh, I'm going to be able to provide the, the results, right? You know, for price competition, there is full revelation possible. You know, there could be a, a trading association. You know, we can be taking a mechanism as a trading association where agents pay fees and, and you know, maybe these fees can actually reveal what is going to be the, the demand, the real demand that they are facing. But this will not happen, for instance, with quantity competition. With quantity competition, there will be no mechanism at all where there is, can, can be any information sharing whatsoever. So, yeah, I understand that maybe uh, finding the reduced forms will be a challenging task. Uh, for what I'm showing here is that, well, I, for some games at least, uh, you know, it's not so complicated, even though the both agents are taking actions and their actions uh, depend on the entire hierarchy of beliefs. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, right. you know, we can find. Uh, so does, does this F? Like does this F? Uh, so can, can you go back to just to make sure I get them? Uh, does this F H uh, E H L? Does that thing? I understand what this is in the context of your paper, but does this have a a, uh, a game theoretic interpretation for this game that you were just telling us about? Does that... Yeah. So basically, it's going to be capture the the actions of both agents. The exactly. actions or the payoffs of the actions. The actions. So it's going to be capturing 
the actions for right. both. I'm going to be capturing the sum of the actions and I see. and because I can understand what are going to be the, the, the sum of the actions, I can understand what will be the payoffs as given as a reducer form representation. That's correct. Right. And here, my action as a, as a firm in this game, my action does uh, does it depend ex exclusively on my first order belief? No. Or it depends on the whole depends hierarchy? On the entire hierarchy. Okay, yeah. Right. Thanks. Um, one yeah. thing I noticed, seeing this square, it kind of makes me think a little bit about potential games. And I think, at least for some parameter values, this is a potential game. Have you explored or thought about that connection at all? Do you think that's making this tractable? Mm, no, but I am looking for more applications. Um, yeah, so I definitely look to it. Thank you for the recommendation. Uh, okay. Yeah. Just to just yeah, keep it, uh, an eye on the time, it's five minutes left. Yeah, so yeah, just let me just conclude. Uh, well, this, this uh, paper is trying to analyze what, what can we do when we have simple assumptions are regarding commitment power for, for the designer of the mechanism. You know, in the particular sense of neutral mechanisms, you know, we don't require evidence-based model, contracts that punish agents if they take one action or the other. I would like to see what can we do with these simple mechanisms where potentially I'm just giving money to you, right? Uh, I found that, that reduced form approach is useful to understand this because of the nature of neutral mechanism, I can separate the problem in two. One is finding the reduced form and the other one is analyzing the information sharing problem. Um, and basically I try to capture this notion of supermodularity and submodularity, which are to the best of my knowledge new in the literature. Uh, what I try to do is provide applications of you know, important games with economic meaning where I can show when and how information sharing is possible by using this class and when, like kind of like pointing out which tools uh, we need uh, for, for other types of Bayesian games where information sharing is in some sense more difficult, right? Like as in the case of quantity competitions, for instance. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Oh gosh, that's uh, the four minutes late early. <laughs> Thank you very oh, much. Early. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that is on my on my clock. It's a, you you finished. Ah, okay, sorry. So so maybe I can give you a, a little oh. bit insight about another another application. Um, yeah, so, sorry, my my clock my, my watch is grown. <laughs> so let me give them. That's good because I would like also to describe another application. Uh, this is a little bit slightly more simple because it's going to be a game where only one of the agents take an action. But this is a very prominent uh, game in the literature. So basically, there are two agents, a, a bureaucrat that's going to be taking the role of the expert and the policymaker that you know doesn't know the state of the world, the, the layman in this case. Uh, in this game, there's going to be a finite state of space of the world. The expert is going to be taking no action, uh, only the policymaker, which is going to be an action that is going to be a policy. And the payoffs are going to be you know, given by this quadratic form again. Uh, where the bureaucrat is going to be biased. Bias in a linear general way where the bias is going to have an intercept and an slope, right? So basically for these payoffs, we are going to have that the optimal policies for, oh, sorry, for the layman is going to be just match the state with the, with the action. And for the expert, well, he's going to have a preference, uh, you know, linear, uh, Modific a linear function of the state of the world, where B1 and B2 could be either positive or negative or zero. Well, not, not zero for B2, but, uh, but other than that, uh, um, here are some examples of different, uh, different biases. Uh, for instance, uh, where the, basically the horizontal line is the state of the world and the vertical line is the action. The, you know, the, the policy maker always wants the, the you know to match the state of the world he, he likes the identity but the bureaucrat you know could be like you know if like we have we are in a setting like reference solvable or maybe we have like the slope of the states depends on on you know the, the optimal action depends on the slope as well or even strange situation where maybe the expert would like to have a, a lower action for higher states as in this case right so here we are having different examples where we have some of them are going to have directional agreement, right? Both of agents would like to increase the action when we increase the state of the world, but there are other situations where we have directional disagreement, right? One example could be, for instance, gun control, 
you know, there are some politicians that think that higher crime should be related to higher gun control, while there are other politicians that think that it should be the otherwise, right? So we have different political issues. Well, maybe most of them are we are in a setting where we have directional agreement, like for instance with climate change, you know, higher climate change, you know, higher uh, tax uh, to, to carbon. But there are other settings where we have actually directional disagreement. And what I'm showing here is that basically uh, the supermodularity condition is going to be satisfied when we have directional agreement, and the submodularity condition is going to satisfy when we have directional disagreement. So basically, we have uh, a strong discontinuity in the information that we can share in terms of the parameter V2, which basically governs the slope of the of the of the preferences of the expert. Uh, and basically, what, what I'm showing here in the same way as we have a discontinuity with the parameter alpha, here we have a discontinuity with the parameter V2. And importantly, these results here are invariant, are, are invariant with respect to the with the parameter V1, which basically describes the absolute level of disagreement, right? So the absolute level of disagreement is, is, is innocuous for the sake of uh, information sharing. But what is important is if we actually agree in the direction of the right of the action with respect to the state of it. Um, basically, here it's a setting where we, action is going to be only depend on the first order expectation of the state of the world, which is also an accurate statistic. And um, basically, all the supermodularity, supermodularity condition is basically just taking second order derivatives of these expressions, and basically uh, it leads to these uh, nice clean results. Um, Ernesto, can, yeah. can I can I just interpret this result because the the yeah. classic this is the these are the classic payoffs under chip talk right so um, the your result is that although we know that chip talk doesn't in the case of directional agreement generate uh, full information uh, unless p two is equal to zero um, there is some neutral mechanism that will deliver that. That's your result. Yeah. And yeah, that is given. Yeah. Well, it's right. not my result. He was first discovered by Krishna Morgan. Mm -hmm. The impossibility result is new, I think, which is basically says that when we have directional disagreement, not even partial information can be achieved, even though we as we have like right. all this set of tools. Right. But but the so that's that's very general. The the cost of all of this is that. There isn't an algorithm, so in a sense, um, we don't know what that neutral mechanism that will deliver or will not deliver is. In general, we we have to go and find and construct it. Is that well, right? The proof of the the proof of the relation principle finds finds the mechanism to achieve that. Um, okay. Yeah. So it tells explicitly what are the transfers that need to be done mm -hmm. in order for. Ah, okay. For okay. okay. Sorry, I missed happen. that. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay, uh, any other questions? Yeah, I'm finished. Yeah, okay, excellent. So Ernesto, if you're finished, then we move officially. Let's move officially to the to the to the Q and A session. And and our normal um, process is that we start or give floor first to our panelists. Um, I don't know. Let's go alphabetically. Jan, if there are any sort of comments or or questions. Sure. Um, yeah, my first. Uh, Common, I guess, at a high level, you know, I'm I'm less familiar with psychological games, and I'm I'm used to using the revelation principle a lot. So when I looked at your setting, kind of the first thing I thought was, um, you know, why don't you use the revelation principle and and approach it that way? So I was curious, did you think about doing that, or what do you see as, um, you know, the advantages of your approach? Um, you know, because I guess one, you know, to play to make the argument for the revelation principle, an argument that's that's uh, made for it is that you don't have to deal with all these hierarchies of belief. That the, the whole reason we like the revelation principle is we don't have to worry about this. And, you know, you develop these great techniques to deal with the complexity. Um, and I wonder, is there a reason you think it wouldn't work to kind of go straight to the revelation principle? So, so great question. So the revelation principle, you know, as um, reduces the set of mechanisms that can be achieved, right? And right. It, it doesn't itself tell us when and how information sharing is possible, right? Right. It's, so there'd be a lot more work, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly, right? Um, and here, um, and also, you know, if we think that the Myerson revelation principle, when we have like these obedience constraints, 
it become a little bit hard to actually characterize because it's not only that you need obedience constraints and incentive compatibility constraints, you need to satisfy both, right? Because it could be possible that I may lie and I may also disobey. So would you have like these double deviations that may right. arise in this type of mechanism, which is, you know, is I whether it's like more simple to characterize all the possible double deviations that analyze, you know, the payoffs of the of the agents in terms of the hierarchies of beliefs. I don't know, it's not that clear to me. There are some papers that actually do, you know, characterize double deviations, right? You know, uh, Johannes Forner has one about mediation in the facing of war, right? So there are papers that do that. I am providing an, a different tool that, you know, potentially can be helpful in some games, for instance, for these simple quadratic games, uh, maybe potentially for these potential games could be useful as well. Uh, yeah, it's just another alternative that, that I am offering uh, to people um, to, to try and, to analyze this. And just one follow up on that, uh, that another potential connection, thinking about it in terms of uh, the revelation principle and seeing your supermodularity and submodularity conditions made me think about Roche's theorem and cyclical monotonicity, which is also somewhat related to uh, sub and supermodularity. So I, I just wonder so, so, if there could yeah. be some connection there as well. Um, okay, can you repeat that? I was, I was just coming at it from the revelation principle paradigm. Another potential connection I see is between your condition about sub and supermodularity and Roche's characterization of what's implementable with transfers in terms of cyclical yeah. monotonicity, since cyclical yeah. monotonicity is quite connected with sub and supermodularity, yeah. just made me think there could be a connection there. Yeah, yeah. So I do the connection in the paper. Oh, you so do. Okay. In particular, when I when I do not have real state of the world, a real number state of the world, you know, it's not clear what supermodularity means if we don't have an order on the state of the world. So I provide a sufficient condi conditions in terms of cyclical monotonicity. Oh. Okay, great. So you're, you're one step ahead. Yeah, okay, great. Is, yeah. But thank you for the suggestion. Excellent. Um, and Jacopo, any, any last comments or questions? Um, yeah, not really. I mean, um, I I like this. I, I think you gave a very nice presentation. Thanks for sharing your work with us. And, um, you know, I guess my two uh, two main comments refer to complexity and to the restriction to neutral mechanism. Uh, they're not that they're not important comments in the sense that complexity it's inevitable uh, given the generality of uh, of the problem you're 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 attacking. Um, and to some degree, you know, so the problem with these things is that. Uh, Analyzing games in which uh, only first order beliefs matter, it's tractable, it's feasible. And then as soon as you introduce um, uh, some strategic uh, interaction, things, things explode. Um, and the application you showed us is very nice because you're somehow you're able to balance this complexity despite there being non-trivial strategic interactions. But on the other hand, there is a, gigantic literature uh, that studies games like the one you showed uh, us in the motivating example, uh, in games in which only the first order beliefs matter. Think of think about the whole literature on vision persuasion, the whole literature on, on cheap talk and so on and so forth. So to some extent, you know, just like uh, going in direction to what Francesco was, was thinking about, kind of specializing the uh, the framework to 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 come come up with general results about those games that could be really uh, really important and exciting and I understand that you know, some of these results have been already uh, 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 proved because because of the interest that that people have in these games but I think there is much more that you could do and it seems that your framework allows you to to make progress in 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 this uh, in this direction. Um, and so, so that that's about complexity. Um, with regard to restrictions, I I, I have, uh, I mean, again, you think you gave a great answer. You're you're, you're essentially you're trying to to focus attention on uh, mechanisms that involve the minimal amount of commitment, um, mm -hmm. and you know. In my view, when I think about hard information, I am making things easier for the designer. Uh, you know, if my goal is to elicit as much information as uh, to to induce as much revelation, information revelation as possible, that's easy. It's easier. So in a sense, you're kind of stacking cards against you uh, by set, uh, focusing attention on this smaller set of mechanisms. Um, 
uh, although I'm not sure if that there is any formal way of, of actually showing what I just said. Um, and so, uh, yeah, and then the last thing is that uh, both uh, <laughs> the title of paper is neutral mechanism. I'm not sure if I like both the, 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 the term neutral <laughs> and the term mechanism. Uh, and um, yeah, but that's just just preferences, I guess. Yeah, I agree. I don't, it's not the favorite word I would choose, but um, yeah, I actually, I'm not sure if I will stick to that word. I will be very happy to hear suggestions if any of you have about how to call this type of uh, mechanism. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, okay, any other questions? Um, I have a, a, a small question. Coming back to the original question of the number of players in the base game, yes. the, the D, um, it seems like if you have that, uh, you know, many players there, but the structure is sufficiently simple, I know, strategic complementarities, it seems like the, both of your examples uh, the oligopoly and the policy making is, is, is yeah. you know, it seems like there would be great interest because, you know, oligopoly, of, for example, the first case, the, the, the pricing system, you know, yeah. it seems like um, going with the number of firms to, to N, whatever. And the second case, the policy making, the follow up game could be, you know, uh, just a market instead of just a, whatever the monopolist. Yeah, I I think that there are room to be like easily extended to end agents as long as there is only one that has private information. Now, as soon as you have multiple agents with having private information, each of them, things become more and more uh, complicated. And the reason is that you may be like, you know, the, the, the stick and the carrot that is allowing, you know, for information sharing is that you're going to receive some money, right? But now, when you have like multiple agents with multiple information, it's not only money; it's also information, right? You know, you, you, your incentives could depend not only money but also information. And uh, it's, uh, it's very hard for me to try to imagine what would happen in such uh, type of environments. I wasn't but, yeah, that I ambitious. That, I was. Yeah, I was. I wasn't. Just... I wasn't thinking about multiple <laughs> experts. I was just thinking about one expert, but many players later on. Yeah, that definitely, I think, you know, it's going to be a little bit more complicated to, to, to find the reduced forms, right? Because it depends on my belief, about your belief, about Ian's belief, about Francesco's belief, about, you know. It's going to be even harder to, 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 to mathematically describe these reduced forms, but I think that, uh, yeah, there should be no problem. But, but I, was thinking, I was thinking that at least one of the two cases you consider should be doable, because, you know, if... You know, there's this literature on on games games with com strategic complementarities, and then the number of players doesn't matter that much. It's easily generalizable. Why would strategic substitutes? Nobody even knows yeah. what it means to have more than two players or something like that. I don't remember exactly. So, so one of the case seems like uh, it is an asymmetry. If you wanted to generalize, how would you would generalize to more more than two players? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I um. I'm also looking to that uh, maybe uh, in the future version of the paper as well to, uh, to include something about that. Uh, you, any speech. other questions? We still have a minute or two. Okay. Yeah, I mean, Ernesto, I mean, um, I was all the time wondering, I mean, how is the mechanism that allows for full information revelation in the, in the, in the price competition game? How does it work? I mean, because I think that you mentioned you know, that you know, out of your 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 theory, I mean, the proof you actually construct the mechanism. So I was wondering, how is this yeah. mechanism? Is there anything that we learned? I mean, or yeah, well, so so basically, this mechanism, um, I'm going to tell you. Look, the demand is high. Here is, you know, I'm giving you a gift to you. You know, it could be that we are two businessmen. You know. Talking and you know, I invite you to my golf course, you know, private golf course, and you know, I give you a gift to you, like showing that you know, looks at things are right, like you know, the demand is going to be high, blah blah blah. So we, we should actually, uh, you know, increase the price. You know, of course, this is not taking into consideration like antitrust issues, right? You know, this is just about what, what can we potentially do. That would be like, uh, like kind of like one mechanism. And if I don't invite you to the golf course, you know, it's basically saying you like, you know. 
we have to be careful because the demand is going low, so we have not to uh, not to en engage in these uh, you know high prices. Um, so so that's kind of like the way the way it could work, right? In reality, uh, yeah, of course, you know there are again antitrust issues. So uh, you know don't take me this literally with the real world because it's more complicated. But that would be one way, like you know me giving you a gift to show you that we have optimistic view of the future. Yeah. And I see. And the more lavish, no, I, I treat you. I mean, the better I treat you, I see. I see. Yeah, the better Maybe. I treat you, the better things are. And I it's see. going to be credible because if I will be really thinking that things are going to be bad, yeah, yeah. I will not invite you to the golf course. <laughs> yeah. Look, I, I think we are moving to, towards uh, in informal chat. So let's stop the recording yeah. here. Thank Ernesto Don't for the great talk. Thank you very much. And Don't Jan and Jacopo for, 